A reading from 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 34. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you assemble as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be factions among you, in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you meet together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. And one is hungry, and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also the cup, after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this, this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself and so eat the bread and drink, the, drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we should not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are chastened so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home lest you come together to be condemned. About the other things, I will give directions when I come. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks for this Lenten season. Uh, though the Lenten season may not be high on our list of things to look forward to, you have looked for so long all of our lives for us to turn to you to live. We thank you for this opportunity to come together around your word, that it might shine light within our darkened hearts, that we might see the sin that lies there and hear with our ears and our heart your call to turn from that sin to your waiting and forgiving arms. We pray that you would bless us now with your spirit, that you would help us to understand this word rightly. <coughs> And through the gift of that Spirit, through your strength of the Spirit, give us strength not only to know, but to do your will in the world. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so, quiz question, uh, most of you are members here, but those of you who are not, do you know how many pastors there are in this congregation? Uh, <laughs> uh, actual called and ordained pastors, um, there's four of them. Uh, we are all the priesthood of all believers, so we might all uh, see uh, that we have a calling here in the church, uh, but we have four pastors here. And I just was kind of reflecting as I looked at the lessons for today, uh, reflecting that, um, you know, the other three pastors, they're, they're kind of real Lutherans. Uh, been probably Lutheran a lot longer than I have. Um, I'm really just kind of the black sheep. But I, I've really, I have seen such a, um, I, the ministry of the other pastors here has really been a witness to me. And the witness of this congregation in ministry, um, I've really kind of come around to some Lutheran perspectives. I, I, I kind of like that grace of God thing. I'm just thinking that that is sufficient for our salvation. Um, so I'm trying. I'm trying my best to be the best Lutheran pastor I am. Um, so I, I got around just for the heck of it. Just, uh, you know, I thought I'd open up the catechism. 
And see what Luther was saying about, you know, these articles of the creed and the Ten Commandments and the Lord's Prayer. And he kind of likes to ask, I, I got to think, looking at the catechism, that us Lutherans, we, we like to ask questions. And that there's one question in particular that we like to ask. And that is, what does this mean? Uh, that's, uh, that's, I want to ask that question. Uh, to, you know that um, we have shared that uh, as we go through the Lenten season, uh, these five Wednesdays, that we're going to focus on uh, the affirmation of our baptism, which is how the early church used to do it. The preparation for baptism was the Lenten season. So as I looked at the order of that, and if I was to give you any homework uh, from this short sermon, it'd be to go to page 201 in your green hymnal and look at those five things that... Um, you know, what that covenant that you promised uh, to uh, remain in with God. That's what we ask people when we uh, have them uh, affirm member, when they become members here, if you want to come forward, we're going to ask you to affirm your baptism, to do those five things, to, we're going to ask you if you intend to continue in the covenant that God made with you. So last week you heard Pastor Johnson talk a little bit about um, uh, living among God's faithful people. What that meant and the blessing of this community of faith that doesn't meet under our own power but by the power of Christ. And so this week we're going to go to the second one. We're going to look and reflect on what does it mean um, that, we, uh, that we meet together as God's faithful people. Well it means two things. Uh, the second part of the affirmation of baptism is this. To hear his word and to share in his supper. So I just wanted to reflect for a, a few moments on, on each of those things. Um, and what exactly does that mean that we meet together uh, as faithful people in Christ to hear his word and share in his supper? Because it's part of that covenant that God, God sought us out in this covenant he was the one looking for us when we weren't looking for him. It's like, even though we are faithless, he is going to remain faithful. He is going to continue to come after us like that one, that one lost sheep of the 99. He will come after us. He has made that covenant to be our God and we are to be his people. So God's part really is in that covenant salvation, right? I mean, let's just think about that. Uh, sending his one and only son to die on the cross and to rise again. Yeah, I think God's got salvation wrapped up in a nutshell. That, that's God's part. Huh? So what is ours? If we are to meet as God's faithful people, well, then that must mean that we are called to have faith. That, that is our part of it, is that we will come to him as a community of faith, not to point to ourselves, but to point to the Lord Jesus. God's part is salvation in that covenant, and ours is faith. And so we will come together as God's faithful people. And I don't know about you, um, but a few challenges in life here and there. I'm not sure that applies to anybody here. Um, but if you, did, if you did have any challenges in your life now or in the past, um, maybe you can say with a psalmist, um, uh, kind of my reflection, uh, please, God, give me some understanding. <laughs> Last line of the psalm I read, uh, we prayed that he would come and help us. Help our unbelief. Help our mistrust of God. Only he can help that. And that's a cry out for the Holy Spirit, which we ask uh, to come not just to be with us, but to dwell in us, to give that understanding of the word that we might apply it to our lives. So we will ask for that understanding from the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, the psalm goes on to say that the word is a lamp to, my, a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Uh, in thy word, in his word, do we hope. And if that word is a lamp and that word is a light, if, if we really believe that, that it is the light of our lives, what does that inherently tell us about us? That we are, without that word, in darkness. That we need that light of the word. We, we need that light shown on our sin. We need to be cut to the quick that, no, God's not waiting there to zap us down. He's waiting to call us back. So that's what we do when we hear the word and we share his meal. We come to see that light that is in the word. And that does tell us that we are in darkness. 
It tells us that we are not perfect people, but that we are faithful people. Uh, I am thankful for the other pastors here for their ministry in faith matters and in preaching. I didn't get it till about a week ago. Uh, how was I supposed to, how are you supposed to be perfect as your heavenly father was perfect? How's that going to work? It doesn't mean that we're going to be perfect people, but we're going to be people who offer our lives in faith. Imperfect lives that are looking to point to the perfect one. And we can only do that through his word and through his meal. Yes, faithful people live together. And what they do is they listen and hear his word. And they also share in his supper. We hear in this word of God what God says about himself and what God says about us. We hear about God and his faithfulness to his covenant and of our need for faith in him. That's, you know, that Romans, uh, Paul did say that's how we were going to be faithful, right? That faith would come from hearing and hearing Christ. That's where faith will come from. It will come from the light of the word. That's where faith will be born in us by that gift of God that is the word. That living word that is Christ Jesus our Lord. In that word, we hear about Christ, and we hear about him, we preach about him, not just here from the pulpit, but we in the world as we go out, we preach Christ, and we preach him crucified, parentheses, for our sin. We preach that word, that Christ that has been crucified. We hear this word and the Lenten message that leads to the resurrection. We remember in Lent that to get to that resurrection, it has to, it must. Jesus would say, it is necessary to suffer, die, and on the third day rise. That that resurrection has to, must, go through the cross and the grave. Because when you and I were baptized into Christ Jesus, we were first baptized into his death. That he shares that he willingly shared that death with us so that as he was risen to new life, we might also live that new life. Knowing the sin that binds us to death, we remember that Christ went through the cross and through the grave for our salvation. That cross and that grave wasn't the end. The end of Lent is not just remembering and focusing on our sin, but that, you know, it, did anybody just, you know, you get the feeling in the Lenten season that God is just pointing the finger right at you? Right at your sin? He's pointing it out. But, but you have to understand God's intention. When he points out that sin in the word, you know how he's pointing? He's saying, hey, you, look at that sin. Now, come here. Come here, not, not that I can kill you, but that you might die to that old life and rise to a new life. I'm waiting for you. I'm waiting for the forgiveness. I, I got it to give. I got one eye on the fatted calf all, all through Lent, waiting for us to turn. In this Lenten journey, we are called to point the finger inward, to see where sin is working in our lives, to see where sin is taking us in our lives. In this Lenten journey, the word shines light into our darkened hearts. But God's goal in shining that light is that we would return to him. And that the goal of Lent is forgiveness. The goal of God is forgiveness. And that is only found and heard, understood, known to bring peace to our hearts in and through his word. So as faithful people, we will gather together to hear this word of life, life that we can't have on our own. And we will also join together to share in his supper. Each weekend we will do that. We will live faithfully together and will remember what Christ did for us. We will come together and hear the words of the meal. We'll We'll, we'll take an even, we'll even go as far as to take an extra six days in Lent to celebrate a little Easter. To remember that the Lord Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. We will come together in Lent um, to reflect on that. 
to remember not only our sin, but the reality of Christ and his resurrection and what he did to, to attain that for us. We will get together as faithful people to remember that. You ever have a family gathering, maybe at Christmas or at, uh, at Thanksgiving or family reunion? Uh, you get together to hash out old times, right? You, you want to hear the good memories. You want to reflect on them and you know, how we can make more good memories in the future. Um, but when we get together here, in Lent, it kind of seems the exact opposite, right? Like we're getting together to reflect on our sin and what can be good about that? What can be good about reflecting on the suffering and the death of Jesus? Then How can that be a good thing? But you heard Paul say it in his letter to the Corinthians, didn't you? As often as you eat of this bread and you drink of this cup, you preach. <laughs> yes, you and me, we, pre we proclaim the Lord Jesus. We proclaim what? His death. We preach, and this is, when we come to the meal, we preach Christ and we preach him crucified for our sins. And in that preaching, we receive eternal life from him. That meal uh, proclaims that he died for our sin. So the faithful get together to remember so we will recognize we will welcome anybody who, who recognizes that body of Christ. Will we do that because we're perfect? No, we will actually do it for the exact opposite reason. We will do it because we are imperfect. The faithful come to remember sin. The faithful come to, to the meal, to see, to feel the host in your hand, to taste and remember that the Lord is good and that through the willing sacrifice of Jesus, he willingly forgets our sins. Like, not just forgets it, like throws the chalkboard in the river. Like, it's as far as east is from west, like if you keep going that way, and that they ain't going to meet. We remember that willing sacrifice when we meet for the meal. So, uh, that's what our Lenten disciplines teach us, right? This willing sacrifice. I don't know anybody else growing the beard, but this itch is like, I'll get, it, I'll get out. <laughs> it's a wit, not point at myself, but that, that Christ made that willing sacrifice for you and for me. That's what the disciplines do. But that willing sacrifice, it's not just a, you know, look what I did, God. Yeah, there's actually two parts to that discipline. There's that first part that we all know about. It's about giving up our will. Not thy kingdom come, my will be done, but thy will be done. So in the willing sacrifices of Lent, in our disciplines, we will give up our will and we will take on the will of the Father. That will that holds us in his hand, never to be snatched out. Yes, that's the willing sacrifice that the kingdom, when it has, though because it has come through the Lord Jesus, that will can now be down done here on earth. We pray before that meal that, uh, that we would forgive as we are forgiven. So it's not any, I don't think it's uh, um, you know, any mystery, uh, uh, and you know, it's a play on words, yes, but when we meet, we eat. When we gather for community worship each weekend, we meet for that meal so that we can understand what it means that the kingdom has come and that his will has now been given to us to make his love and care known in the world, here on earth. But let's just be honest, that's, it's going to take some change. Change that we cannot do on our own. It will be a spiritual change that comes from Lent, uh, but it will have earthly consequences. That fasting and that prayer, do you ever wonder what that's supposed to change? Is it supposed to change God's mind? Is it supposed to change God's heart? But no, prayer does matter. Prayer does work. Prayer does change things. It changes us. We get that only from the word and through the meal. Faithful people admit, get together and we accept and we admit 
that we have need of change from the Lord. It's a safe assumption to say that that word and that meal that we gather around does not leave us where we are at, but it calls us to turn to him. That we are called through that word and through that meal to faithful change. I pray that blessing for us all. For you and for me this week. In Jesus' name. Amen. Please take a few moments to meditate on the word and the will of God.